many other uh, This is right, uh, Arab. Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Simon Marks, and in this bulletin, we'll get you a roundup on stories developing around the world. First up, the day's top headlines. Two school teachers, including a woman, are shot dead in Srinagar. The incident comes two days after three civilians, including a prominent chemist, were gunned down. At least 24 people are killed and dozens injured after an earthquake strikes southwestern Pakistan, causing roofs and walls of mud brick homes to collapse. Russia says it will invite the Taliban to international talks on Afghanistan, scheduled for October the 20th in Moscow. The Kremlin says China, India, Iran and Pakistan will participate in the talks. A row between Iran and South Korea is intensifying, with Tehran threatening legal action unless Seoul releases more than $7 billion in funds for oil shipments frozen because of U.S. sanctions. Israel alerts its foreign missions abroad over a possible Iranian terror threat following the arrest of an Azeri national who reportedly planned to kill Israelis in Cyprus. NATO's Secretary General says relations between Russia and the alliance are at their lowest point since the end of the Cold War. The comments come a day after the alliance expelled eight members of Russia's mission on charges of espionage. And Tanzanian-born Abdul Razak Gurna, a novelist of colonialism and refuge, wins the Nobel Prize for Literature. Gurna writes in English, he lives in Britain. His novels include Paradise and Desertion. Our top story today, two civilians, one a school principal and the other a teacher, have been shot dead by terrorists in Srinagar in the Indian Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The incident occurred just days after the killing of three civilians in quick succession in Srinagar and Bandipura. The victims, Satinda Kaur and Deepak Chand, were both educators in Srinagar's Eidgar area, According to the police, the attack took place at a government-run school. The victims are said to have been shot at point-blank range. Local police claim the terrorists responsible for these killings acted based on the explicit instructions of Pakistani agencies. Police say the perpetrators are trying to create an atmosphere of fear and disrupt communal harmony. On Twitter, Jammu and Kashmir Lieutenant Governor Manoj Sinha vowed a befitting reply would be delivered to the terrorists who targeted the two teachers. The latest attack marks a series of targeted killings of civilians in Jammu and Kashmir. On Tuesday, a 68-year-old local businessman and pharmacist was shot dead in Srinagar. 
The same day, a street vendor from the same city and a Bandipura resident were also shot dead in separate incidents. So far, there have been dual claims of responsibility by terrorist groups for the attacks. The Resistance Front, which is said to be an offshoot of the dreaded Lashka Etoiba group, has taken responsibility for October the 5th, as well as today's attack. Meanwhile, the Islamic State in Jammu and Kashmir has claimed responsibility for the attack on the hawker that happened on October the 5th. However, the police have not yet, yet held any specific terrorist group responsible. Authorities have begun an investigation and are yet to come out with an official version of events. For more on all of this, here's a report by our correspondent in Kashmir, Idris Loan. In the last 10 days, seven civilians have been killed across the Kashmir Valley. R today, two school teachers were killed with point-blank range in the school premises that we are standing in at the moment. You can see that the whole school premise has been completely covered by security forces. They are trying uh, to nab the attackers and that's one of the reasons that this whole area has been cordoned off by the security forces. Just day before yesterday, we saw three civilian killings happening in two in Srinagar and one in Bandipora area. Uh, the famous chemist ML Bindru was killed right outside his shop. There was a, a street vendor who was killed in Srinagar's Lal Bazaar area. And then there was a sumo driver in North Kashmir's Bandipora area who was uh, killed in an attack. Before that, we also saw two civilians being killed in different parts of the valley. So overall, the situation remains extremely tense. The security has been put on high alert across uh, Jammu and Kashmir after these incidents. The Jammu Kashmir police says that uh, this could be to uh, basically raise a communal tension in Jammu and Kashmir. The reason behind these attacks could be that. However, there is a TRF, the resistance front, that has taken responsibility for that attack, for these attacks. But Jammu and Kashmir police saying that they have kind of solved the attacks uh, and soon there will be a press conference wherein they will give details of who are the people responsible behind these attacks. With video journalist Feroz Idris Loan for We On World Is One. Here in the United States, fresh evidence that abortion is once again becoming a potent political battleground. A federal judge has temporarily blocked a law that bans most abortions in Texas. District Judge Robert Pittman in Austin granted the request from President Joe Biden's administration to block the enforcement of the law on grounds that it violates the U.S. Constitution. Texas can and will appeal. The statute went into force on September the 1st. It prohibits abortions as soon as a heartbeat is detectable. It's known as the heartbeat law. That's usually at around six weeks of pregnancy. That is also before many women even know that they are pregnant. There are no exceptions for cases of incest or rape. The 113-page ruling by Judge Pittman said... Texas officials have created an unprecedented and aggressive scheme to deprive its citizens of a significant and well-established constitutional right. From the moment Senate Bill 8 went into effect, women have been unlawfully prevented from exercising control over their lives in ways that are protected by the Constitution. The ruling added, this court will not sanction one more day of this offensive deprivation of such an important right. The Texas law is by far the most restrictive in the nation. It empowers private citizens to file lawsuits against anyone they suspect of assisting in an abortion in any way. As Texas can appeal the order, the case may end up in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. The nine-justice Supreme Court here in Washington, now with a clear conservative majority, decided last month against intervening to block the Texas law. The justices declining to block the law prompted the Biden administration to enter the fray. The ruling comes after tens of thousands of people took to the streets across the United States last weekend. The protests aimed at countering the conservative drive to restrict abortion access. 
The White House has welcomed the ruling as an important step forwards towards restoring the constitutional rights of women across the state of Texas. In recent years, similar laws have been passed in other states, but were struck down because they were deemed to have violated the U.S. Supreme Court precedent set back in 1973. That is the landmark Roe v. Wade judgment that effectively made abortion legal across the country. That ruling guaranteed a woman's right to an abortion until the fetus is viable outside the womb. That is generally around 22 weeks into a pregnancy. Pro-abortion activists have called on Congress to enshrine the right to abortion in U.S. federal law. That would protect it from any possible reversal by the Supreme Court. Because if the High Court overturns that landmark 1973 ruling, Every state across the country will be free to ban abortions if local state lawmakers choose. It's estimated that 36 million women in just over half the country, 26 states, would likely lose the legal right to an abortion. In a major breakthrough against deadly malaria, the World Health Organization has for the first time recommended the widespread use of a vaccine against the infection. The common mosquito-borne disease claims more than 400,000 lives a year. And according to the WHO, a child dies of malaria every two minutes. The vaccine has already been administered to nearly 800,000 children in Ghana, Kenya and Malawi as part of a pilot program over the last two years. This vaccine is a gift to the world, but its value will be felt most in Africa. The World Health Organization on Wednesday recommended the first approved vaccine for malaria should be widely given to African children, potentially marking a major advance against a deadly disease. Using this vaccine in addition to existing tools to prevent malaria could save tens of thousands of young lives each year. The WHO estimates malaria killed 386,000 Africans in 2019. 2.3 million doses of the vaccine Muskirix, developed by British drug maker GlaxoSmithKline, have been given to infants in Ghana, Kenya and Malawi since 2019 in a large-scale pilot program. That program followed a decade of clinical trials in seven African countries. The WHO says 94 percent of malaria cases and deaths occur in Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion people. The preventable disease is caused by parasites transmitted to people by the bites of infected mosquitoes. The vaccine's effectiveness at preventing severe cases of malaria in children is only around 30 percent, but so far it is the only approved vaccine. Another vaccine against malaria, developed by scientists at Britain's University of Oxford, showed up to 77 percent efficacy in a recent study, but it is still in the trial stages. Experts say the challenge now will be finding funding for production and distribution of the vaccine to some of the world's poorest countries. Shifting our focus to Pakistan now, where at least 24 people have died and over 300 have been injured after an earthquake of magnitude 5.7 hit the country's southern region. The epicenter of the quake was about 100 kilometers east of Quetta. Worst hit is the mountainous city of Hanai, where several houses were damaged. Military helicopters were deployed in southern Pakistan after a deadly earthquake struck early Thursday morning. The magnitude 5.7 quake happened as people slept in the southern city of Harnai, collapsing scores of houses and damaging many more. Rescue workers said the dead were mostly women and children, while authorities say hundreds more have been injured or rendered homeless. Crowds of victims and their relatives gathered outside a local hospital past dawn. One medical officer said that the critically injured were being transferred to the provincial capital of Quetta. The U.S. Geological Survey said the quake was relatively shallow and had an epicenter about 100 kilometers east of Quetta. Quetta is also the site of one of the deadliest earthquakes to hit South Asia in recorded history when a 7.7 magnitude quake struck in 1935, killing between 30 and 60,000 people.
In Austria, Chancellor Sebastian Kurz is under investigation, suspected of bribery and breach of trust. There are claims that the government that government money was used in a corrupt deal to secure positive coverage in a newspaper. Along with Kurz, nine other suspects, as well as three organizations, are being probed over various corruption offences. The offices of Kurz's Conservative Austrian People's Party and several top aides were raided on October the 6th. The prosecutors suspect the finance ministry purchased advertisements in a tabloid in exchange for coverage and polling favourable to Kurz and his party. The essence of the allegations is that between 2016 and 2018, resources from the Austrian finance ministry were used to finance partially manipulated opinion polls that exclusively served party political interests. Prosecutors allege that a media company received payments in return for publishing the surveys. All of this took place around the time Kurz took over the leadership of the right-wing People's Party, the OEVP, and led it into government in coalition with the far-right Freedom Party. The latest allegations may put fresh strains on the OEVP's coalition with the Green Party. The alliance has already come under pressure from an earlier scandal. Kurz and his People's Party have dismissed the investigation as politically motivated. In a statement by his office, the Austrian Chancellor called the allegations fabricated, adding that the chat messages the case was based upon had been taken out of context. He added he was confident his name will eventually be cleared. Kurz is attending a summit of EU leaders in Slovenia. Meanwhile, the media company in question has been widely identified as the Usterreich tabloid. The group put out a statement denying any wrongdoing had been committed in the commissioning of publication of its surveys. Sweden and Denmark paused the use of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine for people in younger age groups after reports of possible uh, um, cardiovascular side effects. The conditions involve an inflammation of the heart or its lining. The Swedish Health Agency on Wednesday said the country is suspending the use of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine for people born in 1991 and later. That announcement came after reports of possible rare side effects among youths and young adults, such as myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle, which the Mayo Clinic says can include symptoms that resemble a heart attack. In a statement, the health agency said the connection is especially clear when it comes to Moderna's vaccine spike facts, especially after the second dose. It added that the risk of being affected was very small. The health agency now recommended the Comirnaty vaccine from Visa biontech instead. Some 81,000 people born in 1991 or later had received a first Moderna shot. They would not be getting a second jab. Earlier this week, the Swedish health agency said people aged 12 to 15 would only get the Visa biontech vaccine. The European Medicines Agency approved the use of Comirnaty in May, while Spikevax was given the nod for children over 12 in July. Now, Al Capone, of course, was an American gangster who attained notoriety during the Prohibition era here in the United States. Today, some of his belongings are up for auction. His granddaughters say they hope the sale will reflect the human side of one of America's most dreaded mobsters. This is an auction like no other. And this stuff belongs not to a celebrity, but to a notorious gangster who is often remembered for the dreadful violence he unleashed in Chicago in the 1920s. Al Capone made his fortune as the boss of bootlegging during America's Prohibition era. And though seven decades have passed since his death, he is still remembered for his brutal violence and flamboyant lifestyle. 174 items that belong to Al Capone are now up for auction this week. 
His granddaughters feel that these items will help present the human side of a man who has otherwise been known as one of America's most wanted criminals. I think the, the item that means the most to me is the letter that my grandfather wrote to my father when my grandfather was in Alcatraz. Uh, we always call my grandfather Papa and Papa was sent to Alcatraz in 1934 and uh, my dad was a young teenager and he was living in Florida and uh, Papa wrote a beautiful three-page letter and in that letter he refers to my dad as dearest son of my heart over and over again, uh, he tells him how much he loves him and how much he misses him. The items up for auction range from personal photographs to firearms to pocket watches and jewelry, as well as furniture and kitchenware. Al Capone's platinum and diamond pocket watch is listed for $50,000, while his favorite Colt 45 pistol is expected to fetch as much as $150,000. The items that generate the most interest are the ones that you think of synonymous with a figure, a gangster figure like Al Capone, his guns and his fancy flamboyant jewelry. You know, he, if you go on the internet and you learn about Al Capone, you'll learn that almost every figure in mafia movie book is based on the model of Al Capone, that fancy dress and that jewelry. Al Capone's granddaughters are getting old. It is this that has prompted their decision to sell Al Capone's memorabilia. They feel the world must know what Al Capone was really like in his personal life. Bureau Report, we on, World is One. Boji is a regular commuter on ferries, buses and metro trains in Istanbul. He enjoys log long journeys on public transport during the week and on a packed Istanbul ferry between Europe and Asia, all eyes turn to one commuter, peacefully enjoying his view from the window. Boji is a dog with dark eyes, floppy ears and golden brown fur and he has become a favoured co-commuter for people in Istanbul. We'll leave you with this report. Stay tuned to We on World is One for all the world's developments, canine and otherwise. Months ago, we have noticed a dog using, trying to use our trams, our metros, all our trains, and he knows where to go, he knows where to get out. So it was quite interesting, and we have started to follow him, and it was really an interesting pattern. It's something like that, he knows where to go, and he has a purpose. <laughs> You know what? I just watched him on YouTube two hours ago and now I ran into him here. It's such a surprise. You take the train and suddenly you see Buji. And look at him. He lies just like this. You just smile and catch the moment. Really. This is what Buji evokes for Istanbul residents. He also reminds us that we can still enjoy Istanbul in our rush.